Hi, thanks for tuning in to this episode of ComiCast, the podcast series which looks at the issues which matter to people. This is the second part in our series about housing, uh, the housing crisis, some would say the housing emergency. I'm joined by Lorraine Douglas and Ruth Stiles, both of whom have a huge amount of experience in this area. This one we're going to be focusing on basically the destruction of the public sector. The, the whole housing crisis is the result of being probably the biggest privatisation that we've experienced over the last 40 years. So we're going to be talking about what's happened to council housing and what's happened to public land. A quick uh, introduction now to summarise the issue. Public housing owned and managed by local authorities, call it council housing, reached a wartime peak of 32, 32% of the UK housing stock in the late 60s, early 70s. By 2018, this had dropped to 8%. The number of council homes in Britain has now fallen to a record low. Fewer properties to rent from local authorities than at any point in almost 50 years. Stockholm council houses across England, Scotland and Wales has dropped to just 2 million and has now more than halved in the last 20 years, according to government statistics. Uh, more than 170,000 council homes have been lost since 2010 alone. The majority of those are likely to be properties for social rent, which are offered to local people at around half the cost of private market rents. Now, this loss is the result of a whole range of factors, but commentators particularly highlight the right to buy policy that sees council house tenants given a state subsidy of up to 100,000 to help them buy their home. Now, despite repeated promises from ministers and ministers from um, several governments, from several parties, as we'll discuss, only one new home is being built to replace every five sold under right to buy. Number of council houses in Britain has now fallen by around 70 percent since the policy of right to buy was introduced in 1980, down from a total of 6.5 million then. The local government association warned recently that enough homes to, to house the population of Oxford have been sold off under right to buy since 2012. 54,581 homes have been sold, but just 12,472 built to replace them. Those figures are probably a little bit out of date as we speak, but they certainly indicate the uh, scale of the problem. As the number of council homes has fallen, more and more people have been forced to rent from private landlords and pay rents that are on average up to 50% more expensive. In London, it's significantly more than 50%. The number of private renters, renters has doubled in the last 20 years and now stands at five and a half million. That's inc an increase of a million or 23 percent since 2010. Now, another thing that we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is the great land sell off, which is kind of a corollary of what we're talking about regarding housing. Public land ownership in this country is in a crisis since the late 70s, when the government began what's turned into a long term privatization program about half of all public land, 2 million hectares in total, or 10% of Britain's overall land area, has been sold, mainly to private companies. Local authority and NHS landing holdings, uh, land holdings have been particularly badly hit. Today, local government owns only about 40% as much land as it did four decades ago. The New Economics Foundation in 2020 brought out a wee survey that showed in the previous 10 years, the 10 years prior to 2020, the government had sold enough public land for developers to build 131,000 homes. Of that 131,000, only 2.6% would be for social rent. 15% of the homes were classified as affordable housing, but the definition here is interesting. So the government changed the definition of affordable to include homes rented at 80% of market rates. Uh, that's in London, 80% of market rates is not particularly affordable for the vast majority of people. So it's social rent we're talking about. Well, that generally affordable rent is widely understood to be the only housing generally affordable to people on low incomes. And that's 2.6% of the 131,000 homes built on the sold public land. Now, years of selling off social housing followed by more than two decades of a property market fueled by cheap credit have put households who don't own homes in a really tough position. High rents make it hard to save enough for mortgages that would cost less each month. 
Runaway house prices mean that for some it's impossible to ever save a big enough deposit to raise a mortgage. Low interest rates make property attractive to investors and help those who can afford a deposit raise big sums to buy, but not any help to those who are saving up. Putting things aren't going to be right, but there are things that we can do. So we're going to talk about the problem today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about solutions, but uh, generally speaking, the solutions we will talk about in more detail next week. Lorraine, over to you after that vaguely depressing introduction there. Uh, give me some details, Lorraine, about the Haygate, the Ferrier, and other scandalous bits of vandalism in our neighbourhood here, South East London, why they're allowed to happen and what their short and long term impact is and will be. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, I mean, it's not just about what's happening in South East London. Um, we know that since 2003, something like 13,500 council homes in London have been lost to the sell off of estates to private developers for redevelopment. Very often these go, the, 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 the amount of money that local authorities receive is a pittance because they uh, get rid of the land in exchange for the delivery of um, so-called affordable units by the developers. Uh, and as you've said, those tend to be either at the so-called affordable rent of 80% or even the London affordable rent of 60% of uh, private rents is still far higher than the vast majority of people can afford. Um, or they go for shared ownership, all of which are, are, are classified as affordable housing options. What you're not seeing is the delivery of homes at council rents uh, or even at social rent, at housing association level rents uh, to replace those that have been lost. To give some specifics, uh, in Greenwich, uh, since 2003, there's been a gross reduction of over 1,700 council homes. Now, with um, new council building that is either in the pipeline or completed, uh, we're down to about 1,300, a net loss of 1,300 um, council homes. Uh, and Greenwich does have a programme of council house building, but it will still, uh, on the basis of the current plans, uh, still mean that we'll have seen a net reduction of over 400 uh, council homes as a result of the sale of council estates to the to, to the private uh, sector. Uh, in Southwark, which is uh, has the worst record in London uh, on uh, the sale of council estates, over two and a half thousand properties, council homes have been lost. The vast majority of those uh, on the Haygate estate, which, which I don't think delivered a single affordable unit afterwards, or if it did, it was only um, shared ownership that was delivered, not a single council rented home was delivered. Um, I mean, that's particularly poignant for the Communist Party because the our, our former YCL General Secretary, Mark Ashton, uh, who was a founder of Lesbians and Gays Support the Minors, uh, lived on the Haygate estate and was very active and involved uh, in campaigns on that estate uh, and within his local community. So that has a particular poignancy, I think, uh, for Communists to see that estate going and in fact the, the whole redevelopment of the Elephant and Castle as uh, council land uh, will deliver massive profits for private developers and next to nothing for the local community uh, who've been in, in large part displaced uh, as a result of that development. Uh, and um, you know it's not just uh, Greenwich and Southwark, Lambeth uh, which is southwest London I know 590 homes lost, Lewisham 550 council homes lost and let's be quite clear this is this is the loss of working class housing and being replaced by housing for people with lots of money you know it's being replaced uh, but uh, it's gentrification, it's complete gentrification of traditional working class communities. And I think what's even more disconcerting when we look and we see the iconic brutalist estates that were built in the 1970s, the Ferrier, the Haygate uh, and indeed Robin Hood Gardens uh, in Tower Hamlets have all gone uh, or are going and are being replaced by steel and glass huge tower blocks uh, and clearly not building for the community, not building for families. They're building for the executive class, if you like, and the people who are working in the city or in Canary Wharf or wherever. So um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a good 
uh, outcome, I think, for council tenants. And, and, you know, this coming on top of the loss of homes uh, under the right to buy, I think, is a disaster for working class communities. Yeah, Lorraine, thanks very much for that. I'll tell listeners, we're talking about South East London here in specific because that's that's our neighbourhood. But uh, uh, these problems apply across the entirety of the country. I recognise that fully. One of the more repugnant things about what happened in Haygate was some of the statements from the head of Southwark Council, a Labour head of council beforehand, who made it very clear that people in the Haygate put nice people with nice jobs come into the area because the Haygate people were a bit rough. Then the Haygate was rough, no doubt about that, but there were some really good people in the Haygate. I know people from there, you know people from there as well. Uh, and it was a perfectly decent area, but uh, they wanted to attract somebody who would uh, spend a bit more local money, I guess. Ruth, well, just, I mean, sorry, I mean that, that whole thing about, um, oh, the Haygate was rough, or the Aylesbury is rough, or the Ferrier is rough. When those estates were built, when they were initially populated, they were populated by mixed sustainable communities to use the hill's outcome, because housing was not, um, was not the rump uh, or the, la- the tenure of last resort, which it has become as a result of government policy. You had professional people living on those estates. You had uh, people from all walks of life living on those estates because housing was ba- allocated on the basis of housing need rather than uh, on the basis of extreme poverty, which is essentially uh, what, what, what the criterion is now. It's, 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 it's allocated to people who cannot afford any form of private sector solution to either their homelessness or their extreme housing need. That's, so that's the reality. So to, to, to talk about estates being rough, I used to walk about the Haygate throughout the night, never never had a problem, never felt a problem. That's not to say that people didn't have problems, but you know these, these notions of roughness, I think, are somewhat overstated. Oh, absolutely. Now, maybe because I, I live in Blackheath now, I regard it as a little bit rough. Maybe I turned a little bit soft myself, but I certainly remember... Uh, when I first came to London, late 70s, early 80s, it was a good laugh around there. And certainly having been raised in schemes myself, they were full of, I mean, pretty much everybody you knew lived in a scheme and a whole variety of people. People with good, you know, proper jobs in the civil service and elsewhere also lived in council teams. Uh, they, they, we'll talk about this later on, I guess. The council estates have now become associated with, uh, with people that are kind of outside the pale of society. Okay, thanks very much for that. Ruth, what's your perspective? Socially excluded, Rob. Um, uh, The PC phrase is socially excluded, Stuart. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's a ridiculous phrase as well, actually. But anyway, (laughs) we'll we'll come on to that later. Ruth, you've been very patiently waiting there. What's your perspective on this? Well, I mean, Lorraine is absolutely right about originally council housing being a very mixed uh, population. And in consequence of that, of course, you had uh, mutual support for those who were less able to manage. There were lots of things that happened, like, for example, local nursery provision was provided and organised voluntarily, babysitting circles, encouragement for people to get training and support organised locally by connected people. Lots and lots of different things. And, of course, the more wealthy were putting money into that community that benefited the wider community. The sale of estates did a number of things, I think. One, I think it um, completely destroyed the fabric of the communities within which they were located. I mean, people need to remember that we are not talking about small um, estates here. We're talking of the very large um, housing up to between two and a half thousand people on, uh, on one estate, for example. I mean, there's been several examples of that happening. And Lorraine is also perfectly correct, of course, that before the sale of the estate, the people had been demonized and the communities have been demonized as being violent, rough. It's an area that nobody wants to go into, no-go areas of police. The racism, the sexism, and a whole range of other very much unpleasant stuff that used to take place there was all because they took away, slowly but surely, the right for people to be housed as a matter of choice rather than as a matter of need. And culminates in, of course, the argument that, oh, you can't sustain these things. We've got to do something about these communities. That's not the estate staff, which sells it. And the other 
thing that people don't often talk about, which I think is very important, is that these places were allowed to fall into rack and ruin. And the reason why they were is because the government cut the maintenance, the management and maintenance allowance so low that it was impossible for local authorities to actually provide um, any decent repairs and maintenance services to maintain those properties. So there was a constant barrage of dissatisfied tenants. But of course, this is typical of what the Conservatives do, undermine the service, demonise whoever's associated with it, then say this is not working and gain some support from people who think that what might come along will change it for them. But what in reality has happened is that working class communities have been forced out of their areas. They've been forced out of areas where there was work, areas where there was access to proper services. And of course, this all runs alongside smashing the services of local authorities, 80% of social services being privatised. You had a whole range of different things, complete centralised control of local authority budgets, refusing to allow local authorities to spend money on services that they knew their local communities needed. So the desperation it's, it, it created didn't help either. Now, I, I observed and watched also as the sale of council housing through the right to buy and the beginning of the demise of um, council housing by the estate sales, the wave of homelessness that followed it. Because it is absolutely crystal clear if you were to chart the, the rise and fall of homelessness against the rise and fall against the right to buy and the sale of council estates, you will find an absolute correlation. And the people who were the most affected by that were the lowest income, poorest household, the most vulnerable, and very crucially, young people. And imagine trying to be uh, a young couple, trying to start your life together, where you can't even afford, you, you can't afford to rent anywhere. And quite frankly, uh, you go to the council because mum and dad don't want you anywhere. Council doesn't not only doesn't have any housing, but it's got no responsibility for you. So the destruction was huge and continues. And I think, Stuart, Stuart, you're quite right. The biggest sale and stripping of public assets that has ever taken place was the sale of council housing. And it's an utter disgrace they were able to get, a, get away with it. And politicians made noises about doing something about it, about building again, et cetera, et cetera. And they haven't done it. And the reason why they've not done it is because, one, they don't have a commitment to working class communities and to house people. And secondly, all the skilled staff that were around in local authorities that could have delivered um, housing a new wave of council housing with decent standards, not the shit that they, sorry, excuse my French, but the shit they build now with wooden frame, timber frame. They're building the slums of tomorrow, quite frankly, is what they're building at the moment for working class people. All the nicer premier areas near close to the river, et cetera, et cetera, have all gone at very high prices to the, to the people who've got the money. Anyway, I'll stop there. We, I'm sure there's a lots of opportunities for me to rant on about this later. <laughs> now, if it's a good, coherent uh, diatribe, it's not a rant. And uh, interesting point you raised there. We've got to think, I think, um, about who benefits from this. You say they haven't fixed the problem for various reasons. Now, there are very good reasons economically to build more council houses, but the people that benefit from the current shortage will be the property developers and the bankers. And uh, they both give a huge amount of money to the Conservative Party. I'm sure we'll get onto this a little bit later. Uh, on the point we were talking about, there's a very good book that came out uh, recently by Michael Roman called London's Aylesbury Estate, which is an oral history of the so-called concrete jungle. 
I recommend this book highly. Apart from the price, it's about 55 quid now. I'll probably give my copy to the uh, Marx Memorial Library. Uh, anybody interested in the book, check out the Marx Memorial Library in the next couple of months. It's worth doing it for itself anyway. But this does make it very clear that the Aylesbury, which does have a hell of a bad reputation, had a lot of very good people in it who regarded the place as their home. It wasn't some kind of hellhole ghetto in which you were frightened to leave your door. Anyway, uh, current developments here. Sorry, Lorraine, before we start talking about what's happening in South East London in more detail, the sale of public land I was talking about in the introduction, talk me through the, the impact of that. Well, it's... Um... I mean, when you talk about scandals, when you think that the equivalent of 10 percent of Britain um, that was in public ownership has been flogged off to private developers, that in itself is just incredibly scandalous. What nowhere, absolutely nowhere is there um, a record of exactly how much land is currently in the ownership of private developers or private landowners seeking to sell it on for development. What we do know is that the private sector currently has in its possession over 40,000 parcels of undeveloped designated housing land. So that is land that has been set aside by local authorities and identified as um, available for development for housing. So you've got to ask the question, well, why is there so little housing actually being developed? And if we consider um, the pace at which the private sector was delivering homes when it was in competition with the public sector, when it was in competition with local authorities, we can see that housing was being built at scale with anything up to a half a million homes being delivered jointly by the private and public sector in any one year during the 1960s and 1970s. Since the public sector stopped developing, private sector delivery has consistently been below 150,000 or below 100,000 when the assessed need just to keep up with current demand, leave alone the backlog, is like over 200,000, 300,000 homes a year needing to be developed. So why is it that this that this private sector is incapable of increasing the rate of production. Of course, it's perfectly capable of doing so if it chooses to. It chooses not to because controlling the supply controls price. And if supply is consistently below demand, which it is, then price goes up and price continues to go up exponentially. We know that land values are the principal cause of house price inflation uh, and the cost of, of um, developing new homes. We also know that with the loss of direct labour organisations uh, in local authorities, for instance, we know that apprenticeship schemes have been all but destroyed with very, very few uh, building new building apprenticeships coming through uh, and the private sector generally not being as good at training people to, to, to develop these skills as before. In terms of the overall outsourcing and, you know, the loss of that capacity, that knowledge, that skill within, within the public sector since um, uh, the election of Thatcher in 1979, we now see that where local authorities are starting to build again, they're having to develop private companies or do that through private companies. What they're not doing is bringing back the in-house expertise and resource. So um, uh, I very much doubt that we're going to get to a situation where local authorities, whatever is, you know, whatever um, uh, relaxation there is on the use of right to buy receipts, for instance, or relaxation on council bo borrowing, uh, whatever happens there, we are not going to start to see the building at scale that we need in order to address you know, the, the, the extreme housing shortage and, the, and in particular the shortage of affordable homes, uh, both in London and indeed nationally. That's, that's not going to happen unless there is a complete shift uh, and a commitment to actually return to the sorts of levels of public sector house building that we had a few years ago or 40 years ago. Uh, right, yeah, a range of interesting points there. One thing I'll note on this line, people who know me know I talk about this all the time, but it's quite important. A good 80% 
of the bank's loan book is property related. So it is most definitely not in the bank's interest to see any decline in property values because it will cause a write down in assets, etc. So uh, there are a range of very important interests which are keeping the situation as bad as it is. And remember, the financial sector provides about 50% of Tory party funds. Mm. Ruth, what's your perspective on this one? Well, I mean, I I'm very much agree with Lorraine on this. I mean, the Labour Party is an utter disgrace in this, quite frankly. And I think I am going to touch on this because they basically, um, with the Blair government, abandoned any commitment to council housing. Now, I know why they didn't um, commit to reversing the right to buy, for example, was to do with the housing being part of the public sector borrowing requirement and the EU rules. Uh, and the second reason was they had no commitment to it. And they were, in fact, responsible for a higher level of council estate sales than under the Tories. So there is an issue about political attitudes, our politicians' attitudes and party attitudes towards resol resolving the crisis in housing, because it's quite clear the private sector can't do it. I mean... If we were just to look at the cost of not having decent, affordable council housing, I mean, it costs an estimate in 2017, £1.4 billion a year to the NHS, for example, because of the health consequences. Now, it is quite clear that that is associated, spent, there is other associated spending with that as well. There cannot be just that's just the NHS on its own and the second thing is is uh, it's also quite clear that in current circumstances the poor quality nature of uh, the private rented sector is driving the health and mental health crisis that we have seen I mean one third of people who were uh, reporting that they were you know they had health problems as a result of lockdowns in 2020 were all associated with lack of space and poor housing conditions and being locked up in them i mean of course we also are not counting in the future costs of the disgraceful position we find ourselves in which is the next generation of respiratory heart arthritic and other conditions, the impact on our elderly who are no longer able to remain in their own homes because they're so poor quality, they get shunted out to privatised care homes. So, you know, there's a whole secular public expenditure and all of which, because they've commodified public services in every arena and housing being central to it, that everything goes to the private sector for massive profit and the land banking that goes on for profit is an utter scandal and should be stopped and on our own doorstep by the way we only have to look at what happened on the Thamesmead estate to see a classic example I mean the GLC and the LCC before them was responsible for reclaiming the marshland in order to build homes in Thamesmead the Tories, of course, got rid of the GLC and then set up a, a so-called company to take over uh, the housing there. But what is more important is what happened to the vacant land. And I know that Greenwich Council, for example, tried many different ways of getting developers to commit to building uh, social housing on Thamesmead as part of the brief, only to find them turning around and saying, no, sorry, we're not going to do that. It's too much money at a subsequent point. And, of course, they, the law is so weak that it enables them to breach those conditions of agreement with local authorities. The one They called the Section 106 so-called social benefit through planning law. But, I mean, quite frankly, local people and their families and generations after have been utterly, utterly deprived and robbed by the banking of land and the scandal of what they've done with public land. I'll leave it at that, Stuart. Okay, uh, some interesting points raised there. I can see why the Tories support all this because their people benefit from it. I can never really understand why Labour 
has done nothing about this, unless, of course, they're frightened of uh, saying or doing anything, which sounds vaguely socialistic, and you can't have that with this Labour Party or indeed Tony Blair's. And an important point to remember here, and there have been various studies come out with this, this is a, a recent local authority one I'm looking at here, investment in the new generation of social housing could return 320 billion to the public purse over 50 years and add more than 4 million homes because there's a big supply chain associated with housing. Every one pound invested in new social homes can generate £2.84 in the wider economy and each new social home would generate the saving of £780 per year in housing benefit because the housing benefit bill is huge right now. You build homes, you stimulate the economy, uh, it's a lengthy supply chain to go ahead and do that. Uh, the same will apply to if you insulate homes properly and defend people's health the way you're talking about there. And you save an absolute fortune in your housing benefits. So the economics are relatively clear here. Lorraine, can you, t you touched on this a wee bit earlier. Can you talk about current developments here in South East London and uh, likely impact on the housing situation? Is it going to make things any better or worse? I'll just come back firstly, just, just to answer, I think, give an answer to your question about why Labour um, isn't pushing social housing in the way that we would have expected it to. And I think it goes back to Gordon Brown's friend Prudence uh, and that um, attempt uh, or the decision, a, 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 an economic policy of restricting public sector borrowing to 3% of gross domestic product in order to keep in line with um, the European Union's convergence criteria, even though we weren't going to be joining the euro. And that's why, that's why we've seen the sell-off of, of um, council estates. That's why we've seen the wholesale transfer of council homes to housing associations, which are de facto private sector institutions, albeit um, in theory, run for social benefit. I think a good, goodly number of tenants these days might take issue uh, with that. Um, and going on from that, the, the impact of decisions to demolish and redevelop rather than retrofit and the impact of that on um, you know, the attempt to reduce carbon emissions, since both the, the carbon that is released through the acts of demolition, not, not to mention all the other polluting uh, uh, products like asbestos and God knows what other chemicals that get released into the atmosphere when you knock down uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 an estate that's built with concrete, mm -hmm. and then replacing them with concrete. So in terms of the impact um, of, of this approach of selling off the land and handing it over to the private sector, as well as slowing down the delivery of new housing units, and as well as giving all of the power to the developers to effectively drive a coach and horses through local authorities, Section 106 policies. I mean, routinely, local authorities, Tory and Labour alike, say that all new housing developments should be delivering 35 to 40% either social housing or affordable homes. I don't think there's a single housing scheme that's being built out privately that is delivering anything like that. And it's the developers who are determining what type of affordable housing is being delivered, not the local authority. The developers are saying, we have to make our 30% profit. We can't do that if we're delivering homes for social rent. And that's why I think that's that's the impact. Understand that. Very good point indeed. And also the whole PFI scandal does also derive from the European Union's, this goes back to Maastricht, doesn't it, in the early 90s when we yeah. talked about yep. 3%. And uh, uh, again, all right, this may be a, a subject for another podcast in itself, but uh, PFI is a mega scandal and directly derives from the European Union. So what about local developments though? Which are the local developments happening now which you think are going to uh, make things any better or perhaps a lot worse? Uh, I mean, I look at what's going on in the so-called Kibbert village and uh, superficially, I can imagine people looking at that and thinking it looks so much nicer than um, the ferrier used to look, partly because I think, you know, um, brutalist design is definitely a matter of taste. Actually, I like it. Uh, I think that it has uh, a really... Uh, you know, gives a really dramatic look. And when you look at, you know, some of the stuff that's retained, like Balfron Tower and Trellick Tower and all the rest of it, you can actually see the 
you know the design quality uh, of, of that um, of those things. And I think you know there were mistakes made uh, in the development of some of those those estates. Uh, you know, and sort of in terms of the, the public realm and, and the amenity space and the quality of the amenities that were produced. And sometimes, of course, they were, they were not built to a particularly good standard or, you know, corners were cut in the development. But um, what's going up now has no kind of, there is no real, you don't walk through that and feel like there's any sort of an identity. It's just random tower blocks that are being, feel like they're being just plonked, you know, in, in a particular area. Um, and it is just tower blocks. The landscaping is nice, uh, but you know, as an aesthetic, I think it's seriously lacking. It kind of just just takes away any kind of um, almost uniformity. I, you know, I mean, it's very difficult. I'm not an architect, so it's difficult to kind of think of the language. But um, I would rather have been on the ferrier with relatively low rise, um, you know, blocks with clean lines, with, you know, with all that concrete. An improvement to the public realm there would have been a far better and a far cheaper option than knocking it all down and starting again, in my humble opinion. I'm with you. I know a couple of people from the old ferry. There were very nice places inside, very well furnished indeed. Yeah. And by no means everyone there was some kind of a socially excluded psychopath that used to like going around. Mugging. My best mate lived on that estate for 12 years. She said they were the best 12 years of her life. She loved it there. And most of the people I know that lived on there really enjoyed being on there. There were some people who were desperate to get off for all sorts of reasons. And as I say, there were some issues um but most of those were about funding at the end of the day it was about the restriction um on council budgets not being able to get in there and do the work that was necessary to actually bring it really up to standard so sell it knock it down and put up these private tower blocks instead it's just yeah the place to me looks like a bit of a mess and uh, something i noticed driving around the neighborhood when you go through Woolwich in particular these days and we'll talk a bit more about this later on it's like there's some kind of social apartheid taking place there because one side is old Woolwich and the other side there's a whole bunch of people that seem to live in kind of semi-gated communities who have nothing to do with anybody else who lives in the neighbourhood. There's nothing uh, semi about it. It is gated. There is a part of the arsenal that you can't get on unless you've got a bloody fob key. Really? So, oh, right. so, you know, they, they, it is definitely, and it is, I mean, it, you you could almost, I think almost nowhere in London is gentrification more starkly um, demonstrated than what is going on in Woolwich, where you've got all of this development going on on the waterfront, all the views of the Thames, all of that, completely hidden now, because, but from, from people on the other side of the road, basically on the other side, the other side of Woolwich or Plumstead Road, uh, completely hidden. We've just seen the loss of the Morris Walk estate, which has just been knocked down. Uh, the homes that are being put up there, the majority of those will not be for council rent. I think there's a small number of them going up for council rent, the vast majority of them. And that's another, I don't know, six, seven hundred, however many council homes that have just gone for a burden. And the majority of those were still in council ownership because they were flats rather than um, houses. So, um, yeah, it's not great. I mean, I'm looking out of my window now and I, you know, uh, and I'm living in Plumstead in a, in a former council flat, looking out, fantastic view out of my window. I know that when uh, the development uh, moves further eastwards uh, along the waterfront, which it's, which it's scheduled to do, most of that will probably be gone. Uh, before much longer and we know that the whole of the waterfront on on Greenwich is up for development they just recently agreed uh, on Morden Wharf on the waterfront uh, in Greenwich to build 33 storey blocks of flats I think five 33 storey blocks of flats I guarantee there won't be a single one for council rent in there uh, and they will be beyond the reach of probably almost any current Greenwich resident unless they're the current rich Greenwich residents. It's a dangerous time to make predictions, Lorraine, but uh, I'm with you on that one there. No doubt about that. OK, Ruth, what's your perspective on all this? Well, I remember the days when there was a commitment to opening the riverfront in Greenwich to local people because historically there had been encroachment by companies and various other people. And there was a commitment to building walkways so that local people could enjoy being at the riverfront. 
And of course, when the uh, GLC went, so did that commitment. And quite frankly, you talk about apartheid. Um, it's absolutely stark. It's so stark, it's in your face. But the other thing that's happened is that there used to be a lively, thriving, working class series of community centres, pubs and um, markets in and around Woolwich, all of which have gone. And they've all gone because the working class people who lived in those areas either can't afford the high end prices that are now being demanded or where they used to go has been demolished. What do young people do? Young people have no youth services. I mean, people fail to look at. I mean, I listen to people moan about young people saying, you know, they're just layabouts, they're causing this trouble, that. When I was a kid, there were youth clubs. There was activities all the time. There was on the council estate social activities organised. And I know that in Woolwich and across Greenwich, that was the case for a, a whole load of council estates because I was engaged in meeting with people at those community centres. But they've all gone. They've all gone. And the other thing I think that um, is, is really important, I mean, there is an example of this kind of apartheid, of course, that took place over in the, on the Isle of Dogs when Thatcher handed over to the London Docklands Development Corporation all the vacant land there. And then I was working at, for the Tower Hamlets Tenants Federation and what was really interesting was the complaints from the people who were living in the swanky houses with their swanky cars were having their cars vandalised by the local kids. So they built a wall. But that didn't stop the local kids because what they saw was, you've taken all of this from us. And they saw it as a direct attack on them and their community. And the danger of all of that, of course, is is that it marginalises people further and it increases divisions. I mean, the other, the other thing I would say is, is there's been several different traditions in these working class localities, some of which are good, some of which are bad. There's been some racism where the National Front has come in and tried to move in, like they did in the 80s on the Thamesmead estate and tried to recruit the National Front. Um, but there used to be a huge diverse communities in and around these areas, uh, you know, every race and creed working together through, through community actions. And, you know, I'm a part-time qualified youth worker and I used to spend my time doing a lot of um, what we did, what was nicely called conflict resolution. What it was about was sitting them down and saying to each other, saying to them, for God's sake, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and talking to them in the language and then finding out what their real grievances are because behind it all is a grievance of being left behind, nothing for them. So my perspective is very clear that it, it wrecks local, class, local working class communities. It wrecks the entire notion of community cohesion. And it also wrecks local, local political activity because local communities with cohesion voice what they want. Without that cohesion, they don't. I, and I think that's actually a really important point, Ruth, because the working class were organised on their council estates. They were organised in their trade unions and they were organised on their council estates. And women in particular played a huge role in uh, organising the tenants uh, you know, and making demands. They ran the tenants' federations, uh, you know, and they got their they got their neighbours involved and they got their neighbours involved in campaigning. And we've seen a systematic attack since 1979 on tenant organisation, a political attack on tenant organisation. And what you've got now, even in even in Labour authorities, is effectively a clientization of uh, tenants and residents so that the, the, the whole narrative, the whole agenda, the whole organisation is actually in the control of lo the local authority rather than in the control of the tenants themselves. They don't want, uh, you know, no local authorities, no housing associations want to see genuinely independent, uh, well-organised, participative tenants federations, tenants organisations being redeveloped because they are a pain in the 
a pain in the backside of landlords and a thorn in the side of landlords. They don't get away with a lot when your tenants are well organised. Congratulations on the restraint and language there, Lorraine. I'm proud of you, mate. Okay, <laughs> let's spell out a few things now regarding housing inequality, which uh, this is a nice seamless way of getting into this, I guess. Housing affects inequality in a number of really important ways, because differences in house prices across neighbourhoods limits where poorer people can live. So higher demand for houses in the most desirable neighbourhoods will tend to push up prices in locations with access to good schooling, low crime and also access to transport, abundant employment opportunities and a pleasant physical environment. I think they're talking about Blackheath here. So this means that the housing market has got a key role in sorting poorer households into areas with the worst pollution, schools and employment prospects. Inequality gives us a housing market problem because a small number of people with a lot of money and access to credit inflate the overall house prices in a market with limited supply. So kind of everything we've been talking about culminates in this. And that housing market problem goes on to perpetuate inequality as fewer people have the ability to buy a house, the growing rental market eats a large chunk of their income, their net wealth falls behind that of those with property. They're forced out of good central areas with easy access to jobs, so they have to travel more to work, which costs a hell of a lot of dosh. This isn't just happening here. This is what happened in Chile, interestingly enough, another neoliberal economy. And uh, back in uh, September 2019, they put the price of the traveling up in the Chilean metro, and that kicked off the riots because so many people had to travel from, I mean, I've been to San Diego a few times. It's a big city. And so people had to travel a hell of a long way into work and that kicked off the whole thing, which has had a good happy ending now, hopefully. Let's hope that uh, the forces of reaction don't do what they did in 1973. But people in better areas tend to have better access to good schools, facilities and networks. And that helps perpetuate better chances for their children. And so the cycle continues. And also people in better areas and uh, many of my neighbours are like this don't like council schemes being built near them, despite their liberal pretensions. And they tend to exert more local and national political influence on poorer people. So the latter continue to be expelled to the periphery, both literal and metaphorical. Uh, Ruth, what's your view on that? <laughs> well, inequality in housing. I mean, I've got lots of things I could say about this. I mean, it used to be the case that local authorities would monitor across a whole range of issues, race, sex, um, age, disability, et cetera. And they would use those statistics um, from their contact with the local population to assess um, need in their locality and direct resources to it. Now, if you were to look at the housing needs um, registers now, which are through the roof, um, quite frankly, local authorities no longer monitor and because uh, they don't have the resources to deliver to the people most in need. So we have a situation where there's always been an issue about uh, black and ethnic minority people getting access to housing. They were a significant number of black and ethnic minority tenants in council housing. Even there, however, there was some issues which over years was attacked and resolved. It was worse in some areas than not, and funny enough, very often in Tory controlled council areas. But in the main, there was at least a commitment to do something about it. In private rented sector housing, of course, landlords get away with, don't like your face, don't rent to you oh, you're on housing benefit, no housing benefit tenants. So the poorest of the poor don't get access to housing whilst the landlords cream everything off of the top. Women take the brunt of the poorest housing conditions because they spend the most time at home and they have the most stress. I mean, women today, I feel sorry for because they're working, raising families have got the poor housing conditions and low wages and low household income. It's the worst of all worlds in a world, by the way, where being a woman is subject to be at, at being attacked as well. So, you know, there's a whole range of things there. And for young people, I've touched on the issue of young people, young people's opportunities 
completely undermined by the privatisation of housing, by the privatisation of education, by the removal of youth clubs, by a whole range of factors. And then moving into a world of work, which is the gig economy, where quite frankly, you couldn't even afford to buy a loaf of bread at the end of the week on, that, on those wages, if you could afford it at the beginning of the week, that is. So in terms of equalities, Council housing was, it, when it was originally conceived, when it was originally built, was all about addressing social inequalities. And whilst there were mistakes made, for example, they didn't take account originally of the whole issue to do with different backgrounds, um, quite frankly, we were getting there. And then all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out from underneath their feet. And then you have to ask yourself this question. Where were the majority of people with physical disabilities housed? And the overwhelming majority were in council housing. And the reason for that is because councils built properties specific and large enough for their needs and, and understood the need for a spare room for a carer and understood the additional costs that were involved in those things. And they owned... Um, specialist housing units for those who had such severe disabilities, they needed assistance. Where are we now? Look at Grenfell Tower. Disabled people on the 24th floor. I mean, that's an utter disgrace. So inequality in housing will never be addressed by the private sector. They have zero interest in it. They make noises about it in lip service and they'll get on, for example, and do message around International Women's Day. But they, what they don't tell you is, is they don't pay them anything other than less than the minimum wage or there's no equal pay in their company. So, I mean, there's a lot of lip service. There isn't actually any practical delivery. And the other thing that is important is the building of communities that went alongside the building of council housing was a mutual support network for people. And people understood when we had refugees coming in that they were going to have difficulties. So local people took it upon themselves to assist. They would come along and say, do you know where the local school is? Did you know there's a local youth club? Give them curtains and other things to help them when they were first arriving. I mean, I saw that with the Chilean refugees. I saw it with the Vietnamese refugees. Working class communities are incredibly generous when it comes to refugees. Not so much the more, the more well-off people. I could talk for hours on this subject because it makes me so damn angry. Anyway, I'll leave it there. It's a very good point. And I remember quite a few people from uh, the, like, the big Vietnamese community in the ferry at one point. Uh, and uh, for all this talk about council house people, schemies being racist, they, the vast majority of people took them in and made them feel very welcome. But a lot of caricatures are burned about this and uh, tendentious caricatures too. Lorraine, can you uh, wind things up for us? Housing and inequality. Well, I, I mean, I just, actually just coming back on that last point, I was part working um as part of the response at Grenfell and, and I witnessed with my own eyes how that community mobilized in stark contrast to the complete chaos from the from the from the local authority response of the local authority and the government response to that and it was real headless chicken time it kind of really brought home to roost particularly in Tory authorities just how ill-prepared they were for dealing with this kind of emergency you know I mean they they were hopeless they were absolutely useless and um you know and I was part of that um whole uh the, what they call the silver response like de dealing with the the aftermath and trying to get people into temporary accommodation and it was crap but the working class people on the Latimer estate rose up and actually helped those people materially. They were bringing food in. They were bringing clothes. In. I mean, it was astonishing. Sorry, I get quite emotional. Working class solidarity at its best. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important to remember that, that uh, 
there is a tendency to go ahead and demonize, well, not just the Russians at the moment, but working class people in general. When, when you look at uh, the way many people on the liberal so-called left talk about this, it's a matter of demonizing people. Yeah, and absolutely. I think um, I was talking about this to the trademark guys a while ago. We were talking about um, sanctions. And I think people forget that uh, there have been sanctions against the working class, for, well, for the last 12 years in particular, and they come under the heading of austerity. Okay, Lorraine, uh, finish up for us and let's, let's go back on talk about inequality and housing, please. Well, we can say, I mean, let's, let's look at what this government has actually done. And in 2012, they changed the basis on which housing needs assessments were done. Previously, these were done on a, normally on, on every five years or so, what they called a strategic housing market assessment, where they actually went out and did a, a pretty detailed survey of housing needs, looking at how house, households, the breakdown of households, income of households, ethnicity, uh, and so on and so forth. And from that, they would develop a housing plan identifying the number and types of homes that were needed. So, for instance, you could identify the number of people that would need level access accommodation, for instance, uh, people with disabilities. It was used to help inform um, uh, strategies for the development of supported housing. All of that used to be done. In 2012, this government came in, they drove a coaching horses through that and created a system which basically enabled the government to determine how many homes needed to be built in each local authority area and if that local authority failed to deliver the number of homes through their planning system then the government would come in and impose and actually do things like say right well we can build on that amount of greenfield land or whatever and the, the, what's going on at the moment is that communities are being told accused by government of nimbyism that local authorities are building in automatic delays in the planning system and that's the reason why homes are not being delivered, as opposed to developers saying we won't build homes on your terms, we'll build them on our terms or we won't build them at all. That's why housing is not being delivered. But what it does do is it takes control from local communities to decide what their local plan should be, where homes need to be delivered, what types of homes need to be delivered. And that means that those local communities are being excluded and it guarantees that the people who have the, the, the lowest voices the least power are actually not getting their needs reflected in these so-called new housing strategies that are being built, that are, that are being developed. That's that's the impact. You know, this is not just um, uh, a happenstance uh, uh, result of policy. This is deliberate. It is built into the policy. We are seeing, uh, you know, a systematic attempt for. Uh, publicly owned land, publicly owned assets to be transferred, privatised to the private sector. Working class communities are being increasingly pushed out to the peripheries in cities. And as you've correct, correctly identified, Stuart, that means those people cannot afford to work where the work is, which, it, which is quite often in the, in, in the centre of, of cities. When we've got you know, poverty about to explode in this country because of a failure of government to manage the economics uh, of, of um, a privatised energy system, for instance. Uh, when, when we see this happening, we are going to see, I think, an absolute explosion of need, an explosion of housing need, an explosion of poverty. We can expect to see uh, homelessness go through the roof if um, rents start to go up as a result of this and it's inevitable that landlords private landlords are going to want to be uh, maintaining their profits uh, and so it is inevitable that they are going to be seeking to put rents up beyond housing benefit levels which in most cases they are in london anyway and that will mean uh, an explosion of homelessness again for the most unaffordable uh, particularly in london OK, yeah, quite right. And I think that um, inflation is very much profit pull. You can check out my little leaflet about this on the party website if you're interested. But it's talked about cost push uh, because that phrase gives the impression that there's working people trying to keep their wages at a reasonable level that cause inflation. Uh, when what we're looking at now in the energy industry in particular is a huge amount of people suffering because they want to maintain the margins of the privatised industries that run energy which have given 82% of their profit over the last five years to shareholders in the form of dividends. 
anyway another issue and another podcast comrades thank you very much indeed for that and uh, thank you for listening this has been Comicast. we are anti-capitalist anti-fascist anti-racist but very much for the working class always seek understanding beyond your immediate perception thank you very much cheerio